Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. Life in Florida was supposed to be my fresh start, a chance to rebuild after a rough divorce. I'd always been close to my brother, and when he offered me a place to stay, while I got back on my feet, I jumped at the chance. It all started innocently enough. A piece of mail here, a package there, all addressed to my sister-in-law at our address. At first, I didn't think much of it. Maybe she was between places and just needed somewhere to receive mail. But as the weeks turned into months, the stream of mail became a flood. I tried to talk to my brother about it, but he always brushed it off. He'd say she was just going through a rough patch and that it was temporary. But I had a feeling in my gut that something wasn't right. Then Hurricane Ian hit. Our neighborhood was devastated and we were left picking up the pieces. That's when I decided to apply for Federal Emergency Management Agency assistance. I sat down at my computer, filled out the online application, and hit submit. But instead of a confirmation, I got an error message saying my information was a duplicate of another application. Confused and frustrated, I called the Federal Emergency Management Agency hotline. What I heard next made my blood boil. I explained to the representative that I was calling about an error message I received while trying to submit my application for assistance. The representative asked for my address and last name, which I provided. They then told me that someone had already filed an application using that address. Shocked, I told them that was impossible, as I lived there and hadn't filed anything yet. The representative then mentioned the last name under which the application was filed. I knew exactly who it was. My sister-in-law. She had never lived with us, but she had been using our address for months. And now she was trying to claim Federal Emergency Management Agency assistance meant for us. I hung up the phone. How could she do this? What else had she been using our address for? I knew I had to act fast. I called the Federal Emergency Management Agency Disaster Fraud Hotline and reported what had happened. Then I contacted the United States Postal Inspection Service to report the mail fraud. But I couldn't shake the feeling that this was just the tip of the iceberg. I confronted my brother that evening. I asked him if he knew his wife had been using our address to file for Federal Emergency Management Agency assistance. He was shocked and couldn't believe it was true. I explained that when I tried to file our application, I was told someone had already done it using our address. My brother tried to suggest it might be a mistake, but I cut him off, telling him to stop making excuses for her. I pointed out that this wasn't just about the mail anymore. She was committing fraud. My brother fell silent, the reality of the situation finally sinking in. I could see the conflict in his eyes, torn between loyalty to his wife and the knowledge that what she was doing was wrong. I told him we needed to do something about this. I explained that I had already reported it to the authorities, but we needed to protect ourselves. When he asked what I meant, I suggested we freeze our credit, warning that if she was willing to use our address for this, who knows what else she might do. Over the next few days, we took action. We froze our credit with all three agencies, ensuring that nothing new could be opened in our names. We started sending back all of her Mail marked does not reside here, but I couldn't shake the feeling that this wasn't over. A week later, there was a knock at our door. It was Karen, my sister-in-law, looking furious. She demanded to know what we thought we were doing. I turned the question back on her, asking how she could use our address to file for Federal Emergency Management Agency assistance, pointing out that it was fraud. Karen tried to justify her actions, saying she needed help and that we had no idea what she'd been going through. I countered, asking if that gave her the right to steal from us and potentially get us in trouble with the law. Karen dismissed my concerns, saying I was overreacting and that it wasn't a big deal. My brother stepped in, contradicting her and saying it was indeed a big deal and that she couldn't keep doing this. Karen accused us of taking sides against her, but my brother insisted it wasn't about sides, but about right and wrong. Karen stormed off, but I knew this wasn't the end. Over the next few weeks, we received calls from debt collectors looking for her. We discovered she had tried to open credit cards using our address. It was a nightmare, 
but we stood our ground. We continued to report every incident, document everything, and protect ourselves. Slowly but surely, the tide began to turn. Two months after the initial Federal Emergency Management Agency incident, we received a call. Karen had been arrested for multiple counts of fraud. The evidence we had gathered had been crucial in building the case against her. I never wanted it to come to this, but I knew we had done the right thing. My brother was devastated, but he understood the necessity of our actions. We're still rebuilding, both our home and our lives, but we're doing it honestly, with integrity, and that's something Karen could never take away from us. I worked as a freelance agent, which allowed me to travel frequently. I loved my job, but I always looked forward to coming home to my little slice of paradise. Little did I know that my latest trip would be the catalyst for a series of events that would turn my life upside down. It was a crisp autumn morning when I returned from a month-long work assignment in Europe. When I pulled into my driveway, something felt off. The neighborhood seemed unusually quiet, and there was a strange tension in the air. I brushed it off, chalking it up to jet lag, and made my way to the backyard to check on my beloved garden. What I saw next made my blood run cold. My entire backyard had been raised to the ground. The lush grass, the colorful flower beds, the vegetable patches, all gone. In their place was a massive concrete pad, complete with painted markings that looked suspiciously like a helipad. I stood there, mouth agape, trying to process what I was seeing. That's when I heard a voice behind me. I turned to see a middle-aged woman with a perfectly coiffed hairdo and a sickeningly sweet smile. She was flanked by two men in suits who looked like they'd rather be anywhere else. The woman, who I'll call Karen, greeted me cheerfully and told me about the new community helicopter landing pad they were finishing up. Shocked, I exclaimed that this was my backyard. Karen dismissively acknowledged that technically it was, but explained that the homeowners association had decided it was the perfect spot for their new amenity. She claimed it would boost property values. I protested, saying they couldn't just do this and that they hadn't even asked me. I insisted it was private property. Karen told me not to be dramatic and mentioned they had sent out a notice about the community meeting where this was decided. She implied it was my fault for being away in Europe instead of attending to my civic duties. I was seething. I hadn't received any notice. And even if I had, they had no right to destroy my property without my explicit permission. I threatened to call the police. Karen left off my threat, revealing that her husband was the chief of police. She suggested I should be a good neighbor and embrace this wonderful addition to the community. That was the moment I snapped. I stormed back into my house and started making calls. First to a lawyer, then to every local news outlet I could find. By the end of the day, my story was all over the local news. It turned out I wasn't the only one who'd been steamrolled by the Homeowners Association. As more people came forward with their stories, a pattern of corruption and abuse of power began to emerge. The Homeowners Association president, Karen's husband, and several board members were using their positions to line their own pockets. The helicopter pad? It was meant to be a private landing spot for a wealthy developer who was planning to build a resort nearby. I sued the Homeowners Association for destruction of property, emotional distress, and a host of other charges. As the case progressed, more and more dirt came to light. Embezzlement, fraud, even blackmail. The Homeowners Association leadership had been up to their eyeballs in illegal activities. The court ruled in my favor awarding me a million dollars in damages. But the real victory came in the aftermath. The corrupt homeowners association members were exposed one by one, leading to criminal charges for many of them. Karen's husband lost his job as police chief and is now facing jail time. Karen herself was last seen packing up her fancy clothes and fleeing town in the middle of the night. The other board members resigned in disgrace. These days, our neighborhood is a much different place. We still have a homeowners association, but it's run by people who actually care about the community. Every now and then, I'll be working in my garden and a neighbor will stop by to chat. They usually ask about what happened to the helicopter landing pad idea. I always respond with a bit of humor saying, it never got off the ground.
I've always been the go-to guy for organizing get-togethers among my friends. Maybe it's because I'm a bit of a control freak, or maybe it's just because I genuinely enjoy planning things. Either way, when summer rolled around, I knew it was time for our annual barbecue bash. This year was special. My best friend had just turned 30, and we wanted to celebrate in style. We'd been friends since college, roommates for years, and now he was hitting the big 3 nail. I was determined to make it memorable. So there I was, pushing a trolley through the local supermarket, loading up on everything we needed. Burgers, buns, salad fixings, chips, and of course, a good selection of drinks. I had a mental checklist and was ticking items off one by one. My friend, despite being freshly 30, still got carded regularly. It was a running joke among us. I'd often tease him that he'd still get carded when he's 50 and he'd always roll his eyes and mutter something about good genes. Speaking of my friend, he was trailing behind me, occasionally tossing items into the trolley that I'd missed. We were chatting and laughing, excited about the upcoming party. Finally, with a trolley piled high, we made our way to the checkout. The total came to a whopping 320 pounds. I winced a bit at the price, but reminded myself it was for a good cause. As the cashier started scanning, I noticed her eyeing the alcohol. The cashier then asked to see some ID for the alcohol purchases. I told her it wasn't a problem and fished out my driving license, handing it over. She examined it closely, looking at it, then at me, then back at the license before returning it. Then she requested to see my friend's ID as well. I turned to my friend, expecting him to pull out his wallet. Instead, he looked sheepish and admitted he didn't have his ID with him. I questioned the cashier if it was really necessary, pointing out that my friend was 30. The cashier said it was store policy to ID everyone in the group when alcohol was being purchased. I argued that it didn't make sense, since my friend wasn't even buying anything, but the cashier insisted those were the rules. Frustrated, I looked around and noticed a family at the next till. They had a child with them and were clearly buying alcohol. I pointed this out to the cashier, asking if they were ID checking that family too. The cashier, getting irritated, repeated that she was just following policy. I protested, stating how absurd it was and that my friend was clearly over 18. He was 30. The cashier remained unmoved, explaining that without ID, she couldn't sell us the alcohol. She gave me the option to either purchase the rest of the items without the alcohol or leave. I stared at her, dumbfounded. This was ridiculous. I'd spent over an hour carefully selecting everything we needed for the party, and now it was all going to waste because of some overzealous enforcement of a nonsensical policy. The cashier then asked if I'd like to purchase the items without the alcohol, reaching for the bottles as if expecting me to give in. But something in me snapped. I'd had enough of this nonsense. Calmly, I told her that I wouldn't be purchasing anything today. The cashier was surprised and asked me to repeat myself. I reiterated that I wouldn't be buying anything and wished her a nice day. I turned to leave, abandoning the entire 320 pounds worth of shopping on the conveyor belt. As we walked away, I could hear the cashier spluttering behind us, calling out about our groceries. I didn't even look back. My friend looked at me with a mixture of shock and admiration, commenting on how intense the situation had been. I shrugged it off, reasoning that if we had to stop somewhere else for the drinks, we might as well give them all our business. When we neared the exit, I heard quick footsteps behind us. A man in a suit, clearly a manager, came rushing up. He asked us to wait, saying he understood there was an issue with our purchase. I explained the situation, telling him that the cashier had refused to sell us alcohol because my friend didn't have ID, despite him clearly being over 30. The manager, looking flustered, tried to smooth things over. He suggested we could work something out, and that there was no need to leave all our shopping behind. I declined, stating that their policy was ridiculous and that I'd rather take my business elsewhere. The manager, now desperate, pointed out the large size of the purchase and suggested making an exception just this once. I challenged him on this, asking if he was admitting the policy was flawed. The manager looked trapped, opening and closing his mouth a few times, clearly unsure how to respond. I told the manager that I understood they had policies, but when those policies 
defied common sense, they needed to be willing to use their judgment. I pointed out that today, they'd lost a $320 sale and a regular customer and asked if it was worth it. We then walked out, leaving the manager standing there, looking deflated. And with that, we drove off, ready to find a better place to shop for our barbecue. My mom, a single parent of four kids, struggled to make ends meet. I understood her challenges, so I tried to help out whenever I could. As I got older, I noticed a pattern emerging. My worth seemed to be measured by how much money I could contribute to the household. It wasn't stated outright, but the expectations were clear. If I didn't chip in, I was somehow less valuable than my siblings. Things took a turn for the worse when I faced a personal crisis. I lost my job and was diagnosed with a serious illness in the same month. I needed support more than ever, but my family's response was disappointing to say the least. When I reached out to my mom for help, she brushed me off, saying they couldn't afford to help and that I'd figure it out on my own. My siblings were no better. One claimed they had their own bills to pay, another suggested I should have saved more money, and the third was too busy to even talk. Their indifference hurt more than the illness itself. I couldn't believe that the family I had supported for years would abandon me when I needed them most. It was a wake-up call, and I realized I needed to distance myself from them for my own well-being. Years passed, and I managed to recover both physically and financially without their help. I built a life for myself, made new friends, and even started a small business. I rarely heard from my family during this time, which was fine by me. Then, out of the blue, I got a call from my oldest sibling. After a brief exchange of pleasantries, they got to the point. They explained that our mom was getting older and needed help, hoping I could pitch in. I was taken aback. After years of silence, this is what they wanted. When I asked for details, they mentioned tasks like taking her to doctor's appointments, grocery shopping, and walks. I questioned why they or the others couldn't do it themselves. Their response was that they were all busy with their own lives and that I had always been good at taking care of mom. They wanted me to drop everything and become mom's caretaker while they continued living their lives. I told them I'd think about it and hung up. A few days later, I received a call from my mother. She accused me of being difficult about helping out, saying she had raised me better than that. I defended myself, explaining that I wasn't being difficult, but I didn't see why I should be the only one helping, when I had my own life and responsibilities. That's when she dropped the bombshell about leaving me a lot of money in her will. This caught me off guard. I hadn't even considered her will or any inheritance but something felt off about the whole situation. I asked to see a copy of the will, reasoning that as a beneficiary, I should have one anyway. She agreed to send it right over. To my surprise, she actually sent it, but what I saw made my blood boil. I wasn't mentioned anywhere in the will. Not a single penny was coming my way. I immediately called her back. When I confronted her about my absence from the will, she fumbled first asking how I saw it, then claiming it must be an old version. I accused her of trying to scam me into taking care of her for free while giving everything to my siblings. She tried to deny it, but I cut her off, expressing my disbelief at her attempt to manipulate me and telling her not to contact me again. Then I hung up. I finally saw my family for who they really were. I may have lost the family I was born into, but I gained something far more valuable, self-respect and the freedom to live life on my own terms. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.